product demo is usually geared towards people just getting a very, very precise feeling of like, this is what you get so that they go, okay, now I get it enough. I, I'm confident enough. Let's just do it. Um, but I don't know if a recorded talk can do can work for that because usually the, the the very detailed product demo is very geared towards addressing the specific concerns that people have. Um, and so what I mean with the detailed product demo is we usually show the prototype. In the on the other hand, in the in the more general talk, it's a presentation and the theory. And yeah. But the prototype is usually shown with several disclaimers. Like the prototype I usually show is uh, an old one, is the V1 2.5 uh, for Katerina and Ashish. Because um, we don't have a presentation of the, the current one. So, yeah. So. Yeah, whatever you feel would be best. Um, the main thing is in Bankless DAO, we've always had this discussion and, you know, we always have, you know, at least in the bull market, <laughs> we always had people coming in, you know, and, and one of the first things that people would start thinking about is, you know, in a community discord is, you know, looking at the health of either, you know, the whole DAO or, you know, specific groups within the discord. Um, and you know, there's been several initiatives to start this kind of research, but, you know, from just what I've seen about the health bot, you know, there's just way better research, um, you know, high quality research going into this topic through, you know, yeah. what you all are doing in our end out. And, you know, so ultimately I'd like to see if, if that's, you know, it makes more sense to, you know, participate and support that project, you know, in our endow rather than always trying to, you know, find, you know, non researchers to look at this research topic within Bankless DAO. Um, so, yeah. Anything makes, that, uh, yeah. Okay. F f thanks. That, that gives me, that gives me enough clarity. Uh, sorry. One, one second. Yeah, because like we we do a lot of onboarding in our DAO, so like even though we get people interested in research and research guild, I always joke that you know our guild should be called. I'm always gonna I'm gonna one day propose that our guild get name get changed to the Do Your Own Research Guild, right? Because that's <laughs> just the the general you know population kind of skill that's needed you know by folks in Web three you know just to stay safe. Um, and it's kind of the ethos, you know, in general. Um, but when it comes to actual research <laughs> and, and the producing and writing of research, um, you know, I've just been super impressed with what I've seen in r and Dow. And so any way I can help our members learn, you know, from r and Dow just makes it easier to do what we do, which is help people get better at doing their own research and then those people that do have you know an interest and some type of life experience in you know high quality research can you know we can have them integrate and join our end out you know or, or other research projects that are high quality again we don't want everybody in the world joining our DAO, you know our discord and bankless DAO. <laughs> you know we are a media DAO. We do develop talent within our DAO and talent of new people into Web3, but when it gets, you know, into dev projects, into research, you know, in, into specific niches, you know, high quality professional projects, I'm just always trying to find ways to collaborate instead of, you know, instead of building that within, you know, our own bankless DAO community, you know. And, mm -hmm. and it's largely what happens is we've discovered like research guild is not the place in bankless DAO to do research. It's just the community in bankless DAO to get connected with other researches, researchers, every project, you know, is doing their own research. So we want to, you know, they're doing their research where they're at. And so we want to connect people where they're at doing their research, not try to be like, you know, 
come to Bankless DAO. The best research is here, you know, because that's just not true. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we can get a pretty big community of researchers, you know. Yeah. So that's just kind of the background in Bankless and, you know, kind of how I see, you know, building relationships in the space. And... Okay. I, I mean, that, that makes... That makes perfect sense. Um, I think then at that point, maybe we can focus a little bit on the on the theory, on the presentation. Ashish, I can use the slides that you shared. Um, Katerina, you, you need to leave in 10. Uh, everything got changed today, so I might be able to stay longer. Uh, it's chaos. OK, <laughs> OK. Um, uh, Ernest, then question related to the intentions that you're mentioning, would it make sense for us uh, towards the end to emphasize some sort of here is how you can engage or how you can get involved or here are things that we need or, you know, like ways to support kind of something along that direction? Yeah, absolutely. You know, on one end, you know, if we can test it. And, and use it and get an experience with it, you know, in our own research guild, that's great. Um, and, you know, other parts of the DAO might find it, you know, useful knowing about our experience yep. and whatnot. Um, but yeah, anything that helps folks, you know, learn more about our end DAO and how to get engaged, maybe specifically through this project is, you know, great as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I guess at that point, the easiest is we have a Telegram group and we have the in-depth article. So I can just mention that for anyone interested, you will, you will share those links. And, yep. and, and that's probably like the best way is like anyone who wants to chat can join the Telegram group and anyone who wants to read more about it, there is 40 pages for them to, to go through. Um, and here we give them a quick overview. Cool. Absolutely, sounds great. Okay, um, I'm I'm good to go. Uh, Katerina Shish, would you would you like to start? We do super quick introduction each of us. Um, then. Sure, sure. Katerina, you'd like to go. Yeah, I can go first. Um, so I'm I'm Katarina. I have a PhD in social network science. So I uh, I study uh, human behavior and the interaction between humans. Um, what what I so I'm 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 a researcher, but my heart always looking forward to discovering new patterns and understanding them. Uh, I teach on the side at Northwestern University. So the method on which the community has track is based. I teach that to graduate students, and I, it's also the content of my blog. So it's kind of everything that I do is part of the community health project. Ashish, or oh, Ernest, if you want to know something, I have to take me Let me let me go. Then we can hand it to Daniel. Uh, so hi. I think uh, Ernest, you do know me. I've been around in Bankless for a while. So Bankless now is one place I love and. Together Cruise, the other place that I've been contributing a lot to. And uh, I come in more from a business startup growth strategy angle. And yeah, we've got a very good complementary set of skills there and together crew anyway. So but just one thing before I pass it on to Daniel Ern is just responding on what you said. Uh, the way you mentioned what you're looking for is very interesting because we just today we sent out a report for a contributor DAO where we studied how are people interacting, what is happening. So so we've actually developed some knowledge on how, what kind of patterns should happen in a contributor DAO, how many people should talk, should listen, what kind of engagements. So it's, it's very interesting. The way you've outlined the statement, we've just done an analysis today. Anyway, over to Daniel now. Thank you. I'm Daniel. Uh, I come from an organization design background, uh, so mostly looking at how teams operate, work together, designing effective organizations kind of thing. I've been in the progressive organization space for about a decade, so DAOs before there were DAOs, and also 
been building communities a few times. And, and so that's kind of the angle I, I bring to the team. Let me share, share my screen uh, and I'll give then a, a quick presentation of what, we're, what we've been doing here. So the so as we're talking the community health measurement by Together Crew, we started this project about nine months ago or something something like that. Uh, actually, a little bit more, close to a year now. We we were seeing a lot of people in Twitter asking, "How do I measure community?" And in general, there was an understanding of what the wrong answers were. There were a lot of people saying you cannot measure community is not possible. And, and I was aware of uh, a body of research around a construct called sense of community that's been developed since the 80s to, to understand community from a psychological perspective, mostly in offline communities. And around that time, Katerina joined uh, or, or Discord, Aaron Dow, and we started chatting about it. And we saw an interesting opportunity to apply the, the, body, the body of thought related to organizational network mapping or system network mapping, uh, sorry, uh, social network mapping, and combine these two, two angles, uh, as well as dig a little bit deeper for other possibilities and see if we could create a framework to provide a meaningful way to understand community. Because partially what that is at stake is that in, in terms of the success of these communities, we, we use very basic metrics, very transactional metrics, and so that's what we tend to optimize. So unless we can find more humane metrics, more holistic metrics, more deeper metrics that actually help us understand the, the root causes, very likely we're just going to go to hyper-financialization route, like total value locked or things like this is the way we measure success and we tend to increase those things. But problematically, those metrics don't really correlate with a successful, happy, thriving community that is resilient, uh, but that they tend to lead more to Ponzi schemes and these sort of things. So we wanted to, to provide a countermeasure to that and try to, to find a middle point in between business logic or the providing the sort of measurements that an investor or the community might want in general while also keeping that humane component to it. So we started, uh, we started going with that. Um, they, they, they spent about the first four, uh, four to six months developing a framework to evaluate the health of a DAO community. It's, it's a framework that is broadly applicable to web free communities and even online communities in, in general. But we specifically focus on, on DAOs because we were interested in how there could be different stakeholders interacting. So you can have what is usually known more as, a, as an audience or like a marketing community. Essentially, you have some users and some people that you're hoping will, will buy a product or service. You have on the other side, sort of social communities where people are hanging together and exchanging knowledge or learning communities of the type. You can have investors, co investor communities that are sharing insights um, and about how to invest or not in, in a token. And you can have a, a worker community or a community of practice where people are working together and trying to create something together to some regard. And DAO communities are particularly complex because they blend all of these types. So we kind of grabbed the bull by the horns and wanted to make sure that we could create a framework that was applicable across these different stakeholder groups to really understand holistically how the how we could operate. Also, as I was saying, then we can use that same framework to simpler communities than a DAO that includes these multiple stakeholders. So we did a, a deep literature review. Uh, we'll, we'll share you the, the article we published about it. It's, it's a little bit long. It's, I think, like about 40 pages that <laughs> of scientific references and so on. But for anyone interested to go very deep, um, we'll share that. Then. From that, we, we end up having our framework. And now we have started to build a tool that allows to apply the framework. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it. But so the idea is that we could, through, the, through this framework, identify specific metrics or indicators that allows us to understand the causes and not just the symptoms. So we are avoiding 
uh, activity metrics in general, like we know, for example, the number of messages in a Discord doesn't mean much because the number of messages goes up and it can be a good thing or it can be that there is a huge argument between people. And by the number of messages alone, we don't really know. Equally, you can have a community that is very noisy where activity has been increasing a lot, but there isn't a real sense of community that's been built. And so when there is a crisis, everyone leaves and that's the end of the community. Instead of that, you can have other communities that maybe are quieter, but where people really believe in what's happening there, they really identify, they have really strong relationships with each other. So when there is a crisis, they'll come together and solve the problem. And the community will actually be stronger after the crisis, after the shock than it was before. So we wanted to identify a series of, met of metrics that allows us to tell these two apart, to, to know really what are the underlying, the fundamentals of what is happening within this community and not just the things that we can see in the surface of like, oh, yes, the number of people is growing. Are there more people or less people? More messages or less messages? Sure, that's nice to know. But as I'm saying, we're trying to understand what, what lies underneath the surface. So that's what the, the framework is geared towards. And then the, the third thing that, we, that was really important for us was to make sure that this was relatively low effort for community managers and for communities uh, as well to participate because there is some fantastic surveys that have been designed, but they are very long. So is the kind of thing that at most you can do every six months. And, and even then you might struggle a little bit to get enough responses and so on. And then it gives you so much data that it's kind of hard to deal with it. As opposed to that, we wanted something that is working almost real time that, or that is always on. So you can see the evolution across time, you can see progress and you can iterate very quickly in real time and seeing, oh, this initiative is working or is not working. This approach to building communities working is not working, let's pilot. No, should I focus my, my efforts more here or there and so on. And, and so we're trying to, to build this real time analytics tool that is also backed by some uh, micro surveys and so on to understand perception and is collecting then a lot of data about the interactions of people in the platform. So when someone says GM, GM, and no one replies, or they send a post that usually are low value pieces of communication. So we tend to discount those. And instead of that, we focus on understanding the interactions. When someone replies to a message, when they're conversing in a thread, when there is an emoji reaction and so on, we know there has actually been a connection between two people. And so that this gives us a way stronger signal than simply having messages. Um, Katerina, I don't know if there is something in this regard that you'd like to add at this point, or otherwise I can continue to the, to the nested systems. No, maybe just like you mentioned the, the, all this data, the, the advantage of, of using the, the disco data or data from a platform is that it's, um, it's a lot of data we can kind of find straight on a specific platform. Also, what I would call objective data because it does not depend on somebody's perception or, or biases. Okay. Cool. So, uh, so about the framework, uh, let me give you a quick overview. So the, the way we understood DAO communities is that a community is built in relation to many other pieces. It doesn't exist in isolation. So a community can only be as strong as the ecosystem it is part of. If the ecosystem it is part of collapses, the community is going to collapse. Equally, within the community, we have cliques or subgroups or these, di these different clusters that are going to form. There is then the relationships between the individuals that are part of these teams or subgroups or cliques. And then at the, at the bottom, we have the individuals themselves. If the individuals are not healthy, the community is not going to be healthy. If the relationships between the individuals are weak, the community is going to be weak. If the cliques are dysfunctional, the community is going to be dysfunctional. So we needed to be able to understand health across these multiple levels uh, of what we call these, these nested system, a system within a system, within a system, within a system. So we need to understand it holistically to really have a good picture of what's going on. Because otherwise you, you will always have very incomplete data and maximize health on some areas or like make sure that, okay, let's, uh, let's say the, the health of the relationship is very good, but the individuals are, are burnt out. 
your community is going to collapse or you're going to have people leaving and all of those sort of issues. And you're not, and unless you can understand these multiple levels, well, you're, you'll always have a blind spot. So we we created different different measurements, different different ways to understand the, the to understand how each of these is operating, and and later on we can go uh, into a bit more detail about it. But to start with the with the ecosystem, what we're doing is, and and this is part of the the reason why it makes a lot more sense to to have uh, a, a project that is focused on building these, as opposed to every project building it themselves, is because if we can aggregate data across communities, we can start to understand the health of the ecosystem, and then we can benchmark how a community is doing versus other communities in this ecosystem. So let's say if the health of the ecosystem is improving and some communities have improving health and other not, others not, then we can start to go a little bit deeper and see, okay, what's the difference? What are the communities that are working well doing that's different from the ones that, that are not working as well? And as well as we start to then go into the, the, under, the, the layers underneath, the cliques, the relationships, the individuals, and all the different particularities there, we can start to see is like, okay, there is a community that is really good at building healthy cliques. What is it that they do that enables them to do that? And there is another community that's really good, uh, that has really healthy individuals. How come? What's the difference? What are they doing? And, and, and so we can start to unpeak as we advance with this research project and accumulate more and more data and look at more communities. And we have essentially more partners jumping in into the initiative. We can start to unpeak what are the real best practices and not just the, the things that we think are working, but maybe have some trade-offs or maybe are simply popular practices and not really good practices. So through this comparing uh, over time, we'll be able to distill more and more knowledge on not only how do you assess a healthy community, but also how do you build a healthy community. Uh, sorry. So, in, in the framework, what we're saying is that uh, community health is an aggregation of how individual members feel and operate within the DAO. So we're gathering perception data, and this is where we use uh, micro surveys, like really, really micro that are recurring. So we don't go as much into survey fatigue, but at the same time, we can gather perception data and understand how people are interpreting the behavior, the events. Essentially, we can map the, the messages and so on, but we also want to understand how people are seeing that. And the only way is really to ask them. So we, uh, we ask them these micro surveys. Then we look as well as how the subgroups interact with each other. And we can do these through receiving all, all the messages, through seeing the interactions. We, we can then map out the social network. And based on the shape of the social network, we can gather a tremendous amount of insight of the role people are playing within the social network and how the different subgroups or clusters of the social network, how they are connected with each other. And this gives us a picture of how information flow happens across the community, where, for example, if everyone is very connected to everyone else, a new person join is going to feel very overwhelming. It's going to be people speaking left, right, and center. It's not clear who is who. It's like so much activity that you don't even know where to start. So that doesn't create a lot of intimacy. And that's the issue with a lot of communities that, that scale. Is at the beginning, they were small and you knew everyone. And it was kind of like this small pocket of intimate relationships. But as it grows and more and more people join, you start to get the feeling of like, oh, the good old days. And people talk about the good old days. But there is the sense that something has been lost. And we can actually see this in the structure where if, if there is a lot of connection and it's a little bit overwhelming, then very likely we're going to encounter that pattern. On the other side, what we want is to have more smaller groups, subgroups that are deeply connected, that are well connected laterally, not just one person connected to others, because then it's kind of centralized and it's fragile. But you want these groups to be fairly distributed within a subgroup, and then these different subgroups to be loosely connected to each other so that you don't end up with silos either. But instead of that, if you need to understand what's happening in the marketing group or what's happening in whichever other subgroup that there is, there is already a few bridges and a couple of people you can ask just for a couple of steps and you can be introduced to anyone else in the social network. So that's the moment when you get that sort of impression that, that we call the, the small world. That is, let's say you travel to another town and you are in a cafe 
and you start speaking with your neighbor and you hit it off and you have a great chat and you add them in some social media and, and suddenly it's like, oh, we have six friends in common. Oh, that's so interesting. It's such a small world. What happens very likely is that this cafe has a specific vibe, a specific style that attracts a specific type of people. And so you have another cluster, another pocket in that other city that is connected to your cluster in, in the city you're coming from. And, and hence you have these connections. And so even though you didn't know everyone personally, you still can get a sense of intimacy in the bigger community without going into overwhelm. Then we have the, the members and how the subgroups integrate with the community. So how people are identifying with the community at large. Do they feel it's part of who they are? Like when we can see this very cl clearly in the way people call themselves. Uh, you, you have it with nationalities, for example, with objective, I'm French, I'm English. That means that people see themselves as part of the English community or the French community or, what, or whatever it is. And when you take that identification to the extreme, people are even happy to, to go to war to protect their group. Uh, yes, exactly, Ernest. As, as you're saying, the the bankless nation kind of kind of goes to that. And oh, I'm I'm a member of bankless. If someone is introducing themselves to that, that that means that being a member of bankless is important for their identity. And so they're going to have uh, this identification. This leads to a projection of some of the same mechanisms that we use with ourselves, like self-preservation. So if someone is threatening the community, we're going to react like if they were threatening ourselves. And equally, if someone in the community is hurting, we're going to help them because we identify with this community. So it's a little bit like if we are hurting. So let's let's go and ease our own pain. So this identification can be really, really, really strong and is a very, very important component of what can tell us the difference in between a community that just falls to pieces when there is a shock and another community that pulls together and defends itself or improves and changes and becomes stronger and so on. And, and then finally, uh, we see the, the ecosystem impact of the, of the DAO. And uh, all for this is something that we'll, we'll have to work on uh, a lot more over time to understand. But for a framework, at least is this idea that if you have a community that is a parasite that is sucking resources from the ecosystem without giving anything back, the health of that ecosystem is going to diminish and the community eventually is going to die like a cancer. It's something that ends up killing its host, killing its ecosystem and so on. So from these, we, we can uh, essentially conclude to, to what we could say is a regenerative view of community in that at the multiple levels of recursion, there needs to be a symbiotic relationship of supporting each other to thrive, or otherwise, sooner or later, the system goes out of equilibrium and it collapses. So summarizing, uh, we say that adult community is considered healthy when it contributes to its nested systems and to itself. So satisfy the needs and aspirations of the members, there are healthy rela relationships and functioning subgroups within, advances its goals, so it's actually progressing and contributes to a healthier ecosystem, which leads it to, so that it can survive and thrive. And of course, here comes the perspective of change, of like the situation is changing and so on. So the community needs to have a level of resilience in that it can absorb shocks without necessarily disturbing disturbing itself or having or falling to pieces then it also needs to be adaptable and change with new circumstances and ultimately have the capacity to transform itself when when really its current function structure and so on is no longer viable then we go to the most extreme capability of, of adapting to change and is complete transformation and that gives us the, the holistic picture of how we are uh, understanding the health of a community, both in the moment and across time and across the different dimensions and, and groups that compose it. So we measure the, the vitals. We're measuring the engagement, the observable behavior. We talk about these, the interactions between people, the participation stru structure, so the, the DAO social fabric, the shape of the network and the sense of community, which is the emotional interconnectedness, both between the, the identity of the community and oneself and between the people, how healthy are their relationship with others. Because as we have started to deploy this across some, some different communities, we have, for example, discovered some 
that have a, a really strong mission. So people really flock to this community and they really believe in the mission and they identify as part of that community, but they don't necessarily have healthy relationships between them. And as a result of, and as a result of that, the community is still fragile. So both are very important. And summarizing the tools that we use to measure it. So we have the organizational network analysis on the existing data of the, of the DAO. Uh, for now, primarily focus on Discord, but we're starting to expand to other platforms to collect a richer set of data. And over time, the idea is that this tool can become a sort of composable analytics module for DAO tooling. So we can really, instead of every DAO tool trying to build their own analytics and having only a tiny amount of data and don't, not necessarily having all the research backing and so on to understand how to use that data and really what to look for, Instead of that, we try to refactor, aggregate, and we can offer a holistic picture and deeper insights. Um, so we also have the, the short poll survey, which at the moment is administered primarily on Discord. And finally, we can do deep dive surveys on the DAO request. So we have a range of scientifically validated questions and others that we are developing that can help us to dig deeper into a specific areas to to get even more information about what can be the root causes or even understand some, some predictive factors that gives us an, an understanding of how the community might evolve over time, how the health of the community might evolve over time based on a richer set of indicators. Um, so anyway, that, that's it. Let me know if you have any, any questions. Um, and equally, Catherine and Ashish, if there is anything you'd like to add, just let me know. And yeah, Ernest, I was seeing a lot of your messages, but I, yeah, I could only read about half of them. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, you know, most of the comments are just, um, you know, describing, you know, some of the problems that you're addressing. You know, it's like, well, yeah, in Bangladesh, we have a strong, larger group identity and, and sense of community. But when that filters down into the nested groups, that's where we start seeing a lot of fragility. Um, and, you know, I totally agree with with the metrics end of it. You know, there's lots of tools out there that are telling you metrics of Discord and tweets and Instagram posts and all this stuff. But, you know, I'm like that, that to me, those metrics don't tell you much about the relationships and in particularly the reciprocal relationships that DAOs try to build that's different from the like tit for tat relationships in most business communities. You know, that's another big difference between Web3 and the sense of community when your sense of community is what drives so much of the value um, you need to look at the relationships. You need to look at, you know, we are in a nested environment, you know, <laughs> and if we're not aware of that nested environment, if we don't have a way to communicate to new people all the time, like this is how we're nested, this is, you know. So yeah, I just love, you know, the whole background to this and how you all are looking at it. And, um, it, it totally jives with our experience in Bankless DAO and, you know, the way different people are, are trying to look at these phenomenons within Bankless DAO, you know, we just largely don't have a research framework to really help us, you know, map things out and understand these relationships. Yeah, I, I mean that that was the that was the main thing, and you know, super grateful to the to the different grantors that believe in us in us early stage when we we're just we want to build a framework, and that was that was all we could tell them. Uh, but now that we have gone uh, quite deep into the research, we're starting to get a picture. And still, there is a lot of work to do. We're, for example, uh, starting to do a little bit of work on an indicator that that is not based on the on the literature review, but is more around the a healthy healthy rate of growth. So we know that if a community grows too fast, there is not enough time to for the new people to really enmesh into the into the social tissue there is going to be the culture is not going to be able to absorb that and equally there is not going to be time to form solid relationships and it's going to start to become very transactional uh, but too little growth can also endanger a community because you will always have some people who are dropping and so on so we're starting to 
to try to understand based on the social structure what is an, a healthy rate of growth and also have an indicator there of going like, well, actually you're probably growing too fast. You're not being able to assimilate the people. You think that this is helping you, but most likely it's going to make you weaker unless you kind of slow down and invest more resources into making that, uh, that growth more organic or vice versa. Here you can push on uh, and go a little bit faster. So there is really a lot of research work to do. We're uh, starting to develop a partnership with some researchers at UC Berkeley, for example, that were looking at governance metrics. And, and so we can also use the, the governance participation data and so on and include it into the analysis. Um, and we have another researcher from, from MIT that's potentially coming in that they were looking at the use of emojis very specifically. So, you know, it starts to become infinite. And, and what we're hoping is that this can be a, a project that we can really make sustainable through some through a, a business model related to the tool, where on one side we can have academics who are looking at the data and constantly generating new insights. And on the other side, the projects who are benefiting from this um, and, and really serve as a platform to bridge these communities and to constantly be advancing or understanding of community health and refining and getting more and more robust metrics to, to measure it and assess it. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, not just, I don't know if you're familiar with like degrowth literature at all, but one of the, you know, I, I tend to look at adaptability rather than, you know, exponential growth you know, as, as like a goal. And what I've noticed in Bankless Dow is, you know, in this bear market, when we lost numbers, those projects that have been successful are the ones that have been able to like come back home and continue to build and on their relationships, even if the numbers have decreased, right? That the, the relationships are deepening and becoming richer. Um, and so, you know, again, the sense of community or these sense-making type of metrics are out there, and we know about them, you know, have known about them for a couple of decades um, or more, but it's not broad knowledge, you know, across most people at DAOs. And um, I think it's, you know, one of the things we're all learning about. And Yeah, exactly. And, and then it, it takes, like, with these sort of, amazing metrics that we have that are more like evaluating them is a survey work. Like for example, sense of community, the traditional way to evaluate it for virtual communities is uh, eight or 10 questions. And, and so if you're trying to measure these month on month, you're asking people 10 questions every month, they're very quickly gonna get saturated. So we, we reduce it to the minimum, to the most predictive of those questions that tend to predict how the others are doing. And then over time, as we uh, as we can combine it with the other algorithms on the passive data and natural language processing and the emoji reactions and all of these other things that we can start to add, then we can hopefully build very good predictions of what needs to be happening in the community that will lead to a good sense of community. So, so we almost don't need to evaluate the full sense of community every time. Uh, but we can simply probe into different things and then we build a predictive model that allows us to, to generate those insights without the community being interrupted or having to, to engage. Um, also on the other side, there is also the perspective that if we can engage the communities with this data, like let's say we run a, a microsurvey, some of the questions that we're building, we're able to show to the community as a mirror, like this is how you're doing. And then the community can create proposals by themselves, like th thankfully endows these could be way more powerful than ever was in corporations and so on, where community members could could see the gaps. If people know the problems, you're going to quickly find contributors who are happy to propose solutions. And then the data will allow you to know whether those solutions are working and have the desired impact or not. Uh, and if you accelerate that, the cycle, then every time people will see that there is a, an outcome of having the, the data, of sharing the data, and they'll be more willing to participate because then the community is improving and you end up with this, this feedback loop of the community participating more, sharing more data, sharing more about their perceptions and so on, engaging more with the, the poll survey, more action being taken, the community improving and so on, and, and just repeating. 
Yeah, and, and in Bankless, uh, we have a lot of role descriptions and, and organizational unit descriptions that focus on management of community tools, but never address building a sense of community. Um, we even had tried to develop a community manager role at one time. Members wanted folks who had a responsibility to develop that sense of community, but what was written was that they just manage community tools. And, and that's the two different things. And of course that program doesn't exist anymore because it didn't work. Um, that being said, guilds in Bankless are, are the units that really drive the, the building of community around similar talents, essentially. Um, you come into the DAO, you find other people that have similar talents, and then that group of people kind of onboard you to the DAO and or Web3 in general, and then you go out, you know, learn about other guilds and projects. And it's only just recently that our governance docs have shifted to where now we're we're trying to track member activity and we still have a mandate we have a mandate guilds have a mandate to attract retain and upskill and the attract and retain also implies having that uh, essentially guilds are a professional association of like-minded you know community members so the attract and retain kind of groups in each guild are the ones that do the onboarding and, and build that sense of community. But while we're just measuring and trying to identify what active membership is now, I feel that once we have that defined, then the next step will obviously be guilds looking at, well, how based on this activity do we build that sense of community? And, you know, again, you know, that's the, the stages that our DAO is in, the stages that our guilds are in. Um, and so, you know, I, I feel this is a little, you know, this would be a great tool and, you know, help, yeah, help folks learn how to make sense of things. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I mean, f for me, it's, for me, it's super exciting also because with, uh, with Katerina, we have discussed a lot about the, the sort of team performance aspect of it. That is not something uh, because we started in as we we're calling it community and in DAO community community is kind of everything. It's very the core team and the the members in the periphery because everyone is part of the community ideally. Um, but in more traditional organizations, what you mean community is you mean marketing side and not the internal operations. So, however, we can use what, like the work we're doing is as relevant, even if not more relevant for the internal operations, because you can see the communication patterns, for example, inside a guild. And, the, and there are certain communication patterns who are more conducive to a performing team, to a performing organization than others. You, you would say is like, do you want the, the team to be more noisy or less noisy, to be everyone talking with everyone or not? And actually what uh, what we know from the data is that you want bursty communication, like, and there is significant research to show this. So it's kind of like generally quiet. Then there is a moment where something's happening. People, uh, people swarm together, start collaborating. So the conversation, the level of noise goes up a lot, and then the issue is resolved and it goes down as well. And so you have these sort of peak and thrusts, uh, and you can see these. So already we could, for example, see uh, across two, three different guilds which ones is having more interesting, uh, more support, more uh, better essentially, patterns of communication that are more supportive of performance. That doesn't necessarily mean that those that don't have it are underperforming, uh, but that's when we can see, okay, this one has a, a really ideal pattern of communication. This one, this one doesn't, how is that working? And maybe the, the guild that doesn't can learn a couple of things from the one that does and increase increases performance better. And, and succeed even more. And we can do these even before something has failed or something has gone wrong, more like thinking on continuous improvement and how can every team be learning from each other, learning from the ones who are doing the best uh, and everyone improving, which is really what we want.
Yeah, and, and, and we, we ended up in Bankless creating a lot of component teams. And so across our guilds, there's no, there's very, there's a lack of communication across guilds and, and not a very good way for guilds to learn from each other. And hmm. the people involved in the guilds, you know, a lot of folks just, you know, because this is a volunteer community with a volunteer worker cooperative, you know, nested with inside it. <laughs> Um, you know, the extra time it takes to collaborate and communicate across guilds and to share that data of what guilds have learned, um, it, it is just not something we have in place. You know, it's very difficult to do right now. And because it's volunteer, you know, folks just don't, you know, we can't just say, okay, on Thursdays, you know, guild coordinators meeting you know <laughs> if guild coordinators you know have and can figure out a time to meet that's great but if they can't you know and they don't you know they 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 can't um so we don't you know um yeah 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 makes sense unless you have like the burning pain point or like the very concrete thing that you're looking for it is like yeah it becomes a bit general and so many competing priorities so I guess, yeah, yeah. I mean, let, let, let's see, let's see how we go. We can, um, if you folks are, are are game to try it, we can start with the research guild, and if we can convince one or two guilds, then maybe through that we can get a little bit more precise insights, uh, or, and then be like, well, here is a particular point to be discussed, and hopefully that helps to trigger a bit more that behavior. Yeah. So do we need to see? the prototype or additional um yeah i, I mean i can i can I, I, like I can yeah i can i can show you daniel. yes daniel you could share if you want the report for together or the the the, the tick mark that that's for together course oh yes uh do you have the the link at hand please uh I'm on the road, so it would take me. It's it's in this book. It's in the community health channel. Uh, maybe you're quicker. I mean, I'm on the phone. Yeah. Okay. In the community health channel and posted uh, a day or two ago. A day or a day or two ago in the main channel. Yeah. Um. Maybe. Yeah. Got it. Perfect. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and thanks, E Trinity, for showing up. Uh, it's a member of our research guild. Um, I'll have a recording of this so that folks can see the first half of it, but, uh, we're starting now to go into see, to seeing what, um, seeing what this looks like, what the health bot looks like. Yeah. So there are, uh, at the moment we have three sections. One is community health. This, this gives kind of the, the KPIs, the over, like, macro level overview this is the kind of things that maybe you want to check every month for strategic purposes that allows you to know how to, where to focus whether the initiatives that you have taken to try to improve something are working or not then we have community insights this is more day-to-day -day things that allow you to take very concrete actions to to improve the the health of the community so include things like member management and so on uh, and then you have member insights, which is really looking at the perspective of the of the individual. So, in in here in community community health, we have uh, these two. Well, this is an example done uh, on Together Crew. Is not all indicators were were done, but so we get uh, an overview. Then the the sense of belonging. This is the level of identification that we are seeing, like how much people identify with the community. Is done with a pulse survey, which we haven't done yet for this mock report. There is the relationships between the people. Uh, then there is the level of cohesion, which shows kind of like how much is enmeshed as a single community or whether there are sub-communities. 
and like a lot of these indicators, there is a Goldilocks. Like if you, if you go, you can go too much into silos, and then it's a problem. But if you go too cohesive, it's likely problematic as well because it can become overwhelming and noisy and unclear and hard to do focus work and and so on. So uh, we we can see, for example, this is just for us in uh, our own internal internal team. So apparently we are we're okay, but on the silo side. So we could maybe work together a little bit more. Maybe to to add an explanation there, we are very very, very big on on using threads, and that leads to the conversation being being siloed because people stick to a certain amount of of uh, threads. Yeah, makes sense. And indeed, we were having uh, for for some time we were having some challenges of communication in between the the development team and and more the uh, the design, the designer side, and the rest of the team. So it was probably we can see that the developers are speaking a lot in their threads, and the other people are speaking in the other threads, and we are not communicating as much as we could. So that's an area of improvement. Then, then in terms of uh, how centralized or decentralized, uh, we tend to be very decentralized. So everyone is participating, kind of like everyone is communicating with everyone, as opposed to having a single point of contact. You can see it. Uh, hopefully, this is big enough, and you can see it in. In the graph, so it's more uh, a distributed network rather than a star-shaped network. And then the the click clicks bridge ratio. This is or a small world index, or like how much do we have these small pockets that have intimacy and they are loosely connected to others. Um, and here we seem to be perfectly on the spot. So we're uh, we're really good with this balance in between being kind of like a high school where there is a lot of tri tribalism or a hairball where everything is too enmeshed. Uh, and, and so we're pretty good. And then the, the ecosystem health, we, we haven't calculated for this. Then in the community insights, uh, we have yeah, the, the number of total active members, newly active, those who are consistently active, those who are communicating with a lot of other people in the team. Um, so we are actually a small team, so this is not showing up here. Uh, and those who became disengaged uh, recently, and we can dig deeper, for example, in these data and see those that became disengaged at specific points in time and those who are returning. Uh, and the disengaged members, we can also see, oh, they were actually newly active members. Um, they were not consistently active and so on. So we had two people who kind of came in and they didn't, they didn't stay. Uh, and yeah, potentially, so here we can see as well the activity and the, uh, we have the jump with a couple of people who became disengaged and new member retention. So how many how many join in this cycle? Uh, this is calculated on Discord joining, so it shows zero because it's, we did it just for a just for a, a small set of sub channels. Uh, those who were newly active and those who are still active. So we kind of had the, the two people joining and etc. That bounced. And then the members inside, so we haven't done the poll survey, as I was saying, but if we had, we could see here, for example, what the what's the rate of burnout or need fulfillment that we are providing our people. So how are they actually feeling about the thing? And so this, this would be the, the main dashboard for the moment is a static report, and we can already produce that one like this. We can do it either including the poll survey or not. Uh, obviously, it's better if we can include it because then we get these these extra indicators that gives us a lot more a lot more insight. And the, and now we are about to launch the the first feature. Uh, well, I didn't I didn't show you all the all the community insights, but there is more here. So we're about to launch this feature automated that shows you when the community is most active. So this is probably good to schedule events. So you can see that roughly around this time. Uh, this is on, on UTC, so around this time, there is a lot of activity happening all the time, uh, and these other times a lot less. Um, and we can also see, for example, the, uh, the shape of the social network and how this, is, how this is connected. And so this matches with the fact that we're a fairly decentralized team. You can see that pretty much everyone is connected with everyone else um, in a fairly cohesive blob.
Right. We're we're a big fan of the Sobel mapping in Bankless. Um, mm. the, the visualization aspect of you know the relationships. I, you know, it, it's just the beginning. Um, you know, just being able to visualize these types of relationships. Um, you know, since we've grown up basically just being used to pie charts and line graphs and bar charts. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so w w one thing we're actually discussing with Sobel, because Sobel can tell you what the, the theoretical structure, like what everyone's role is meant to be and how those roles are fit together. Uh, and here we can see the, the real structure of how people are communicating. How are they? How is the participation going? So we have uh, discussed a, a partnership. We haven't, we haven't gotten there yet, but as we advance, the idea is that we can integrate Sobol data as well, as I was saying, trying to become this sort of composable analytics module for DAO tools. So we can integrate Sobol's data, and then we can look at the discrepancy in between what the theoretical structure is, like what Sobol is showing, and what the real communication is, and understand the gaps and see like, well, these two roles are, part, are meant to be part of the same team, but these two people are actually not communicating to each other. How come? Um, and, and so that gave, that could give us a whole other layer of insight and analysis on uh, on this network map on this network map. But anyway, uh, working together yeah, is all good. Like... Um, yeah, I was gonna say we are uh, we also had some discussions with Dwork, and indeed we could add them as a data source. Uh, it's partially a matter of funding and and doing the work. But it's completely possible, and it's one of the integrations that we're looking forward to to make. Uh, then, equally as well, we are talking that many many DAOs, as they start to grow, they fragment across multiple discords and things like that. And we could actually integrate the data from these different discords together into into a single graph uh, and provide those aggregated insights. It's not yeah, back end wise. Uh, we already built the the functionality, but we don't have it from the front end to, to make it possible. But if we wanted to run the analysis manually, we could do it. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm unfortunately, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to run because I have another meeting now. Okay. But yeah, let me know if, um, let, us, let us know of, uh, of next steps where just uh getting the automated version of the bot so you can have already a bit of the automated dashboard and the rest of the analysis we do them manually as uh in the same format that i show you the together crew sweet and then i'll take this recording um just kind of edit out some of the gaps um and get it as short as possible okay. it sounds good awesome. thanks so much uh yeah really love <laughs> where you're going with the project um uh, no, thank you very much. Really appreciate the support, and hopefully, yeah, we can get it there. The in in Bankless, that would be super exciting. Yeah, so so it would be so useful and so needed. Um...